Welcome back to Simplifying Synthesis. In this video, we are going to look at the anti-cancer target identification of the curcuzone diterpenes. In the last video, we looked at the total synthesis of a range of curcuzone diterpenes, which was published this year by the Adebekian and Di groups, which I'll link in the description down below. In this, I mentioned that these compounds have a potent activity against a broad range of human cancer cells by acting on BRAT1, which is a protein involved in the cellular response to DNA damage. In this video, we are going to look at how they identified this protein target and how they elucidated the anti-cancer effects of these compounds. The first studies that they carried out looked at cell viability. To study this, they used a WST1 assay, which is an improved version of the more common MTT assay. This uses a tetrazoleum salt, which is reduced by mitochondrial dehydrogenase to form a formazan, which has a different color to the tetrazoleum salt. This reaction can only occur in living cells and therefore allows for the colorimetric determination of cell survival. The researchers looked at 10 different curcuzones and of these, eight showed the ability to drastically reduce the cell viability in a dose dependent manner. Compound 2A, which is dimer curcuzone, did not show any ability to reduce cell viability, and this is likely due to its large size, preventing it from binding to the target protein. Compound 3, while showing some activity, was much less potent than the other compounds studied, and this is likely due to the spirocyclic enone in place of the dienone, which is present in all of the compounds that showed potent anti-cancer activity. It is worth noting that the EC50 values which they observed are approximately one order of magnitude higher than previously reported. And the authors attribute this to the full confluency of the MCF7 cancer cells which they used in their assay. With the confirmation that these curcuzones can inhibit cell viability, the researchers then sought to identify the binding protein. To do this, they administered the probe, compound 37, to MCF7 cancer cells and incubated them for four hours, after which the cells were lysed to release the intracellular contents. With 37 now binding to BRAT1, which is the target of these compounds, it could react with a biotinylated azide linker in a copper-promoted azide alkyne click reaction. This biotin tag can bind to streptavidin, which was coated on an agarose bead, allowing for the capture of the protein-bound probe. After washing away the other cell contents and isolating the beads, the protein was subjected to a trypsin digest and the fragments were identified using LC-MS-MS. Label-free quantification analysis was then carried out to identify the binding protein. This technique looks at the spectral counts of mass spec data and compares them to data of known proteins to identify unique fingerprints. It was this technique that allowed the authors to identify BRAT1 as the binding target for the curcuzones, as they saw the largest difference in the concentration of this protein observed when comparing lysates of cells that have been incubated with and without the curcuzone probe. To confirm that this protein was the target of the curcuzones, they carried out a thermal shift assay. In this experiment, the protein was treated with either the curcuzone 1D or DMSO as a control, and the samples were then heated and the concentration of the protein was determined using a western blot assay. This experiment showed that there was a change in the thermal denaturation of the protein when incubated with the curcuzone 1D, which indicates that there is a direct binding interaction between this compound and the protein. To confirm that this binding interaction happens within the cell, the authors carried out a pull-down assay. They administered the compounds to MCF7 breast cancer cells, HeLa cells, which are derived from a cervical tumour, and MDA-MB2311, which is a triple negative breast cancer cell line. After incubation, they labelled and isolated the protein as before, using a biotin tag and a streptavidin capture bead. However, in this experiment, they isolated the protein and then carried out a western blot, which uses a specific antibody to recognise the BRAT1 protein and allowed the researchers to be sure that this protein is the target of the curcuzones. 
The competition, seen between compounds 1D and 37, confirms that they are both binding at the same site. And beta-tubulin was used as a control and doesn't show any difference between the experiments, as it is not acted upon by the Kirkisones. They also used this western blot analysis to carry out dose binding experiments, and this showed that the protein reached a 50% occupancy at just 2.7 micromoles, indicating a high binding affinity for this compound. Confident that they had now accurately determined the Kirkisone binding protein, the researchers then moved forward to look at the effects that these compounds have on the cells. They first generated a BRAT1 knockdown. A knockdown is a cell in which the expression of a gene is reduced, and in this case, they used a short hairpin RNA retroviral transduction to reduce the expression of BRAT1 protein in HeLa cells. This technique would allow the authors to compare cells that have the BRAT1 protein inhibited by Kirkisones and cells which do not express the protein. As before, they used a Western blot analysis to look at the concentration of BRAT1 protein and to confirm that the knockdown was successful in reducing the amount of BRAT1 produced. With these cells, they could carry out a comparative proteomics analysis. This analysis compares proteins in cells that have been treated with Kirkisone 1D or untreated cells, which were incubated with the DMSO as a control. This analysis used the same label-free quantification as was used in earlier experiments to identify the binding protein. They compared this analysis to the BRAT1 knockdown cells and were able to identify proteins which were downregulated in both samples. In total, they found 78 dysregulated proteins in the cells that were treated with 1D. And of these, 31 of these proteins were also dysregulated in the BRAT1 knockdown cells, indicating that 1D functionally inhibits BRAT1. Several of these proteins are known to be involved in cancer progression, including TRIM47, which mediates cancer migration, and POL1, which is involved in DNA repair. Interestingly, none of these proteins had previously been functionally linked to BRAT1, and may indicate new cancer progression pathways that have yet to be discovered. As they had identified several proteins involved in cell migration, which were downregulated by the administration of 1D, the authors decided to look at cell migration in cancer cells as their next experiment. In all three of the cancer cell lines studied, cell migration was drastically reduced after 24 hours of incubation with compound 1D. A similar experiment was carried out comparing the BRAT1 knockdown cells to untreated HeLa cells. This also showed a reduction in cell migration, though not as potent as was seen with compound 1D. To elucidate how the Kirkisones reduced the level of BRAT1 in the cell, the authors carried out an experiment involving proteasome inhibition. In this experiment, they treated cells with compound 1D, and as expected, after 24 hours, this showed a reduction in the levels of BRAT1. However, when they also included MG132, which is a proteasome inhibitor, the levels of BRAT1 were restored, indicating that BRAT1, when incubated with compound 1D, undergoes proteasomal degradation. To confirm that this is the mechanism of BRAT1 reduction, they also looked at the relative expression of BRAT1 mRNA. This experiment found no difference in the expression of the BRAT1 mRNA, confirming that BRAT1 is expressed before being degraded after binding to 1D. In the final experiments of the studies, the researchers looked at DNA damage potentiation, that is, the ability of these compounds to increase the DNA damage caused by etoposide, which is a topoisomerase 2 inhibitor and a known anti-cancer compound which acts on DNA. They assessed the DNA damage by looking at the change in gamma H2AX intensity. This looks at the phosphorylation of the serine 139 residue of the histone variant H2AX and is a known biomarker for DNA damage. In these experiments, they saw that the activity of etoposide was increased when Kirkisone 1D was also administered. To confirm that this was due to the interaction of 1D and BRAT1, 
They also carried out these experiments in the knockdown cell line, and this did not show any difference between the cells that were administered with or without compound 1D in addition to etoposide, thus confirming that this damage potentiation is due to the action of 1D on the BRAT1 protein. Finally, to prove that this effect can occur in the cell, the authors carried out cell viability studies and assessed the combination of 1D and etoposide. In all three of the cancer cell lines studied, this combination showed a drastic reduction in cell viability. This is further confirmed by the results of the BRAT1 knockdown, which showed a similar reduction in cell viability to the cells that were administered with compound 1D. So in summary, the researchers were able to identify BRAT1 as the target of the Kirkison diterpenes. The most potent of these, compound 1D, shows similar effects to cells which do not express this protein, indicating a strong inhibition. They were able to identify that the binding of 1D to BRAT1 triggers its degradation by proteasomes, and this compound also induces chemosensitization to etoposide suggesting that it could be used in combination with this drug to provide more potent anti-cancer activity. Well, that's everything for this week's Simplifying Synthesis. If you enjoy these videos, please like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if you have anything you'd like to see, let me know in the comments down below. In the next video, we will look at an efficient synthesis of tetrodotoxin.